hello everybody um, in the audience. Thank you for joining us for the annual How to Find a Literary Agent panel. My name is Emily Hermesi. I'm co-chair of the Hart House Student Literary and Library Committee and will be moderating tonight's events. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging this land on which Hart House and the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, who each have their own rich and diverse tradition of storytelling. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work and write on this land. And I'm going to take a moment to reflect upon my relationship with the land and its indigenous inhabitants. And I encourage everyone in the audience, wherever you might be in the world, to do the same. So how to find a literary agent uh, will begin with a moderated panel between the speakers. And at 8 p.m., we will take a short break before a how to read manuscripts activity and live question and answer period. During the break, you can put your questions into the chat and I will ask them on your behalf to our panelists. As we encourage active participation in the discussion, particularly during the question and answer period, please use the chat function located at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom toolbar to pose a question to our speakers. We'll endeavor to get as many questions answered as possible uh, and we'll be monitoring the chat. That being said, please remain muted unless explicitly called on by myself or the speakers. Inappropriate comments or speaking out of context uh, by any participant will result in the individual privately being asked to stop. Um, and if they do not, we will have to remove the individual from the event to ensure the integrity and intent of the space is kept. And we remind everyone to engage in respectful dialogue. So before we officially begin, I would like to formally introduce our speakers uh, and thank them for participating in How to Find a Literary Agent. So Beverly is one of Canada's leading literary agents. Her authors include best-selling novelists such as Joanna Goodman, Terry Fallis, uh, Donna Morrissey, and Roberta Rich. Popular nonfiction authors include Ken McGugan, Terry O'Reilly, Jennifer Hostin, Marina Nemet, and Jeffrey Rosenthal. I sincerely hope I pronounced all of those names correctly. Uh, as yeah. we navigate these, okay, great. Um, as we navigate uh, these turbulent times in publishing, Beverly continues to actively seek authors who can create impact. And whether it is in print, eBooks, or audio, it is the well-told story that is the critical factor for the Beverly Slogan Literary Agency. Sam worked on the literary magazines Blood and Aphorisms and The Quarterly in the 90s. He ran the edgy micropublisher Gutter Press from 93 to 2002, and he launched the literary division of the Lavin Agency in 03. Sam's projects for the Rights Factory, where he is the president and CEO, have included bestsellers in various categories, and he's looking for works of all categories. He loves humor and to discover and help new writers prepare their works for the market and build lasting careers with their talents. Paige is an associate agent at Cook McDermott. She is seeking well-written upmarket fiction that both entertains and has something to say. And she's always on the lookout for nonfiction in the memoir, lifestyle, and health and wellness areas. In addition to managing her own list, Paige oversees Cook McDermott's clients' film and TV rights. Previously, she was a right assistant for Cook International. Paige has her master's from Ryerson and a bachelor's from the University of King's College and Dalhousie. 
a born and bred Torontonian, she lives for a good adventure and has also resided in LA, New Zealand and Halifax. And last, uh, but certainly not least, Barbara is an actor turned writer. As actor, she's best known for voicing Sailor Neptune on Sailor Moon. Her screenplay, Modern Persuasion, uh, premiered at Camp Marche 2020. Her debut novel, The Dark House, was shortlisted for the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize 2017. Her second novel, Messenger 93, came out in April 2020 and is CBC Books pick, as well as picked by the Forest of Reading Red Maple Kids Committee. She's an instructor at U of T School of Continuing Studies, where she teaches story structure and screenwriting. Okay. So I'm gonna start off with a fairly easy question um, and I'll, each of the panelists will have an opportunity to give an answer to these questions. So what does an agent do and how is being a literary agent different from other jobs in the literary industry? Um, maybe we can start with Beverly. Okay. Um, well, a, an agent works for the writer. The writer pays the agent usually uh, an agreed on commission on earnings, but it's and the job is, you can say it in the, in the most boring way possible, licensing copyright. Um, a lot goes into it before you get to the licensing copyright stage, but that's, that's the essential thing of finding a publisher and maximizing um, the author's income. If you think of copyright as a cabbage uh, and, uh, and, that the world writes is the whole cabbage, but then you're trying to uh, license different territories and different countries and different languages, and those are the leaves. And not everything good travels, um, but uh, basically that's what one does. It's writer. It's writer centered. Amazing. Um, Paige, I see you nodding. Would you like to add anything to the question, what an agent does and how is it different from other jobs? Yeah, sure. So just to build a little bit off of what Beverly says when she says it's writer centered, the way I often put it to clients or prospective clients is that an agent handles kind of all of the businessy side of things so that they can focus on their art and creating. Um, but of course, we also, well, it depends on the agent. Um, some agents get get more hands-on in terms of the editorial development than others, but at Cook McDermott, we tend to be very hands-on with editorial as well. So we really do a little bit of everything. Um, and that's what sets us apart, I would say, from others in the industry where, you know, editors, Mark, people who work in marketing, publicists, they all have a very specific role that they are experts in. And then we have to kind of understand how all of those different parts of the business work and how we can make them work together as best as possible for the author's benefit, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Sam, how about you? Do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I feel like we're uh, like, so there's a moment when writers get famous, like if you're JK Rowling or you're Dan Brown or Margaret Atwood, and then you kind of control everything. But before that point, agents, an agent's job is to help you not get bullied by your publisher or publishers or all the people that are out there who, um, uh, you know, a default publishing contract, for example, is often in the publisher's interest, not the author's interest. And it's very hard to negotiate until you become a force in the market. And then all of a sudden there's a moment where everything shifts and they're like, we'll do whatever you want. But until that moment, mm -hmm. uh, our job is to fight for the writer to, to, to try to make sure that they can somehow make a living at this. Mm -hmm. Being a writer's advocate is such a huge part of being an agent. And Barbara, how about from the perspective of a writer, what? does a literary agent do? Yeah, so for, for me as a writer, uh, 
I really wanted to have an agent and Sam's my wonderful agent and I'm so grateful. Um, and, yeah, we should, we should declare that right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Um, is it was really important for me to have uh, a gatekeeper before my work went out there, that there was somebody that I trusted, whose eye I trusted, whose ear I trusted, who had a vested interest in the, in the quality of my work so that I wasn't just throwing something out there. I wanted to not just write, I wanted to grow as a writer. And um, so it was, it was an important priority for me to uh, have a, uh, an agent, but also to the other points that the other agents made, which is somebody who's also doing that nitty gritty work and advocating for you and making, protecting you and making sure that you're taken care of. But really the reason that I wanted an agent in the first place was having that, uh, you know, writing is very solitary. And when you have an agent, suddenly you're part of a team. <laughs> so. Um, so the next question is, who should be looking for a literary agent? Um, and so maybe I'll start with Sam this time. So I feel like a lot of people look for agents when they're not really ready, like they haven't, their work has, hasn't really been tested or reviewed enough. And um, often I'll get these pitches and I'll say, that sounds great. And then I'll start looking at it and it doesn't really feel polished. Like uh, at our side, which is, you know, when we get an email from a writer, that, like we get a query where something sounds interesting, we're like, sure, send me some chapters or the manuscript. I want to feel reading it that it, the book could be publishable, meaning that it's at a certain level where you guys all know when you go into a bookstore or a library what publishable means because you've you've seen the books that have succeeded you know already and um so it's really rare i would say out of the you know percentage wise we might get five percent of those that are actually close to that and even then there's stuff that we might want to do to to kind of make the story you know, it, it, it might have a pacing issue, it might have some structural issues, and it might have a really bad ending. <laughs> so, you know, if I like something, I'll often say, I, I think this, we still need some work. So the editorial process is really never, never done, but you kind of want to reach an agent when you feel like confident that this is the best work you can do. Mm -hmm. Beverly, do you have any, um, anything else to add for who should be looking for a literary agent? Yes, it, it, you you want it pol uh, polished. It should it it should be very very well done already. But the only thing I can do uh, at the end and is to to make the book better is to uh, encourage them that it needs another it needs another <laughs> rewrite and. Um, it, it, it's amazing what rewrites can do. <laughs> when, um, and that's all I can, that, that's really all I can do for a writer. I'm not, I don't want to be an editor in that sense, a line editor. Uh, that's not much of a help. The writers, if they're talented and they know what to do um, and you just have to um, get them to, to do it, not to not to rush the process. I think, um, and it still need it still gets an edit often after that, in uh, with the publishers, of, of course. But it's true. Get getting getting a book that it, you can sell that you can represent is very is very rare. Um, you you don't usually get it through um, queer the the, the young writers querying. Um, eventually, something will stick, but Sam was right, it's, it, it, it's hard. Thank you. Um, Barbara, from your perspective, um, when did you know or start looking for a literary agent? When did you know that you needed a literary agent? So I, I have a, a feeling that the agents will probably agree that they get a lot of submissions from writers who actually believe that they're ready, but aren't yet quite ready. <laughs> so, uh, so unfortunately, it's a process of trial and error. And I certainly, my experience was exactly that. Uh, when I thought I was ready to begin querying is when I began querying. And um, of course, I didn't get immediate like, oh, yes, come join our club. Um, it, I got and Sam, Sam was part of this process for me. You know, I see potential. 
um, you're just not ready yet. And so what my biggest learning curve was uh, not giving up, a feeling that I had, uh, my work had potential was very important information for me to put in my back pocket. Uh, but I also had to accept that I wasn't going to go, no, you're wrong. Uh, I was going to go, no, my work, need, my work needs work. I need to grow my craft and my skill and my storytelling abilities. And that is a process of, of, of going back to the manuscript over and over again until you, the, the story finally emerges and your voice is more um, developed. And um, so I think that, you know, you, if you believe you're ready to submit, go ahead and submit. But don't be taken aback or, or, or discouraged if you're, you get the feedback that, you know, it's not ready yet, you know, go back to that manuscript, keep developing your, your skills. Mm -hmm. Paige. That's great. Yeah. In terms of, you know, who should be looking for a literary agent, I think it also depends on what that writer's end goal is. So if they want to be published by a traditional publishers or, you know, one of the multinationals like Penguin Random House or Simon & Schuster, then they're probably going to need an agent just to be able to get their foot in that door. Like we talk about gatekeepers, those big publishers typically only will accept queries that come directly from agents because they need someone to be vetting the work or else they would just be absolutely flooded and, and not be able to um, but if you're writing exceptionally literary fiction, um, you know, something really experimental or poetry, and you are likely going to be working with a, a smaller independent press, then you might not necessarily need an agent. Some of those, you know, accept unsolicited queries directly from the writers um, and actually prefer to work without an agent just because of the their business model doesn't really support the the commission that an agent would take um, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't make really financial sense for the author in that case either so it is important to think about the kind of work that you're producing and you know the type of publisher that is likely to take it on yeah and then that i think feeds directly into my next question uh, many writers uh, don't have literary agents or don't get literary agents until after their first publication. So um, would you say um, that it's necessary for all or for the success of all writers to have literary agents? Um, maybe I'll pass it over to Beverly first. Y yes and no. Agents, in some ways, in most ways, to me, are not gatekeepers. They're they're like marriage brokers. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so that's and um, an agent is vouching for the originality of the of the author. It's not plagiarized. They want to know character. Is the, the publishers want to know character? as well as um, the ta talent. Um, so, but not, and, but uh, again, if it's special, if it's special, like poetry, you have to wait a long time before an agent really wants to handle poetry, unfortunately. Unless you give the inaugural address at the- uh, That's like right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. That, <laughs> she was wonderful. <laughs> she was, yes. <laughs> um, and then there, um, and then there are some publishers uh, who you mentioned don't want to see, don't, don't want to deal with an agent. They think an agent's going to try and drive up the advance beyond what is reasonable for them. And so there's an affordability thing there. Um, there's a new publisher in town um, who uh, uh, advertises that he do, you don't need an agent and, and that's the, the wonderful Ken White, an editor from the uh, National Post, McLean's, et cetera. He's written two or three serious non-fiction books, three 
serious nonfiction. So he's he was a, ma a major editor and um, his new publishing house is called Sutherland House. And, uh, but it's for nonfiction. And he's having a, a tough time getting material at the moment. He, he wants to publish about 12 or some odd books uh, uh, a year, but it's hard to get excellent, serious nonfiction that will drive an audience. And so agents are a very good source of uh, product. So, um, and they, and you, and as an agent, you go out looking for, for product for yourself as well. Um, uh, what books, uh, you know, I mean, the favorite party line is, have you ever thought of writing a book? <laughs> and believe it or not, almost everybody at the party will, may say yes, <laughs> or, but, um, so in, in that sense, um, uh, the, the, a, the agent is, um, it, it occupies that source, source of product in, in the marketplace. Sam, you do it all the time. Who have you getting people to write books? You oh, well, that's because I used to, when I was when I was when I had my literary magazine, I would find somebody that wrote a great paragraph, and I'd say, "We're publishing your paragraph now. Write me a story," and then eventually <laughs> I'd get them to write a book out of it. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, to answer this question, though, I feel like um, every writer who wants to make money through writing should get an agent, even if they are successfully being self-published, because. It's, it's through an agent that you'll get like better foreign rights deals or film or TV deals. So there's That's so right. many other ways to make money other than That's just right. published in your own language in your own local market. And even, mm -hmm. you know, the, the women who did that awesome book, which is um, Bedtime Stories for Rebel Girls, they were, that was self-published originally. It was actually founded on, uh, it was funded by Kickstarter. And then they, um, the people that had turned them down, Penguin Random House and, and apparently 30 other publishers around the world said, we love this book now that it had been proven because it sold so well. And then they needed agents to, to, to do that. But what I found out was um, after the first book, they said, oh, now we know what we're doing. So then they fired all the agents so that they started just doing all the rights deals themselves. But they, they needed agents to figure out the business for the first book. And then after, I mean, I imagine they're going to go back to agents because they'll say, wait, we're not getting the same kinds of deals we got through the agents because the agents have a vested interest in making the most amount of money possible because agents live off the commissions of the deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think if an author is interested in growing their career, so reaching a, like a wider audience, selling into more markets, you know, more translation territories, selling film and TV rights. Like there are a million and one ways now to like break off pieces of your IP. Um, so in order to do that, you are going to need an agent who just knows all the ins and outs of each of those businesses and how they intersect with literary rights and can manage those for you. So, you know, to build off of what I was saying earlier, you might be able to get your foot in the door with a sort of non-traditional or small independent publisher without an agent. But if you plan to keep publishing, you're probably going to want to find representation so that you can, they can help you do that. And, and an agent will be able to then consult with you about, you know, which book should you write next? If you have a few different ideas in terms of what's working in the marketplace and what they know editors are looking for. So there's so much that agents can offer authors. And um, so Barbara, from your perspective, as I imagine you also work with a lot of new and emerging writers, um, do you recommend all of them to, to seek out literary agents? Do you think, feel from that perspective it's necessary? Well, it's a good question because uh, most of my writing uh, writers 
are interested in that, you know, they're interested in traditional publishing, they're interested in, in agent representation. Uh, and of course, because I know it's difficult, it's just another difficult aspect to it. Um, it's it's hard to give anyone a fail safe method on how to how to you know how to get an agent or or land an agent or land a publishing deal or whatever but you know so so it's it's uh it's a little bit like the not, not like a lot it's a lottery where you have to be really talented uh, but there's still an, a lottery aspect to it in terms of there's many more agents than are represented uh, but another another way into the industry i think um i don't i don't this isn't a, um, a world that I inhabit myself, but you know there are other ways into it, which is you know you're building a platform somewhere else. So let's say you're, you know you're you have a, a niche area that actually becomes very popular, and you have your own platform, and that could be a way that you could grow. I, I still think to the the points of the agents that you're probably better off being represented in the long run by an agent, but maybe getting started with something that. Um, that has that gets attention, receives attention. Uh, clearly, having a platform of some kind um, is going to be a way to get there. Having some kind of expertise that you're um, that you're known for is going to be a way to get there. So sometimes it's a long game, um, and sometimes it's like here's my submission and it's wonderful, and and you you, you get you land that agent right away. It depends. Mm -hmm. And so now I guess that we've spoken about. Um, who should be looking for a literary agent? The question becomes, how should writers be approaching uh, literary agents? Um, so maybe I'll start with Paige this time. Sure, this one's easy. You should approach the agent however it is they communicate they want to be approached on their website. Each agent, let alone each agency, but often it's each agent has their own particular way that you can submit to them. So some will want to receive attachments on emails with the, with the full manuscript. Some will want the first 10 pages copy and, and pasted into the body of the email. It gets very specific. So my best advice for how to approach agents is to approach them individually, thoughtfully, and carefully, because that off the bat demonstrates that you're the kind of author we would want to work with, who takes their time, who pays attention to the details. Yeah. Um, Sam, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think Paige is 100% right. Like what I want is somebody that says, dear Sam, I, I read, like this is my favorite kind of query. I read these three books. They were my three favorite books of last year. And then I went into the back of the acknowledgments and you were thanked in each one. So I took it as a sign. <laughs> So I want that. I want a, a connection with the person to say that through your taste in the books that you've done, I think you're, there's something about why I want to reach out to you. Otherwise, it just seems pretty random. There's nothing worse than getting, I'm sure um, Beverly and Paige, you've had this happen where you get that email from some crazy person that says, in the in the BCC field, it has a hundred agents, and it says, "Dear, <laughs> yes. dear, dear agent, I, my book will make you a million dollars." And I just like, "What? How are you going to respond to that?" Like, it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah. So I want a connection. I want somebody to say, "I think based on what you've done, you would like my manuscript, and here's why." Mm -hmm. And you don't need to approach every agent at the same time in the. figure out your like agency list, you know, give it a little bit of time for those agents to read and respond. Um, and if no one is responding, then use that as feedback that something isn't clicking. So maybe revise your query letter, take another stab at the manuscript. Yeah, and so uh, Barbara, I guess the question is how did you approach Sam and how? And yeah. So I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, I don't know how the agents feel about this, um, but something that I think is really important because I also come from, originally from an acting background, and this is very much the same advice. Uh, you know, to Sam's point about um, you know having that connection with somebody, 
you know, attending events, uh, meeting people, um, uh, uh, finding out that friend of a friend who knows the person so that you're not necessarily coming in out of the blue, that the connection is, is so specific, you can actually say, which is what happened with Sam, um, and this was well before he took me on, but my entry point into our relationship was I was at a, a film um, a conference. So I was actually hobnobbing in the film world because we had a film that had just come out. And I met a friend of Sam and uh, my friend happened to say, oh, Barbara's also writing. She's written this manuscript and so on. And this young woman said, oh, I, you know, I know Sam Hyatt. He's a He's a dear friend of mine and, um, you know, I'm sure he'd be open to you reaching out to him. So I could say to Sam, not just like, hi, I'm looking for representation, but I could say, you know, I had this conversation with your friend so-and-so and, -so, and, um, and, you know, I would really like to um, connect with you. And so that led to a very extended, as I said before, process of us going back and forth. But I think any way where you're paying attention, any kind of friendly connection that you can have with somebody can be maybe you, you don't want to force it you don't want to like you know interfere in someone's private life obviously uh, but if there's a convention or a you know some kind of way where you can meet people I think that's an added form of of that intimate connection possibility and they can remember that you had you were the one who had that pitch about the so and so and you can you bring all that stuff up so now they know you a little bit and uh, Beverly, how how should writers be approaching literature? Well, my my first my first writer um, that jo joined me that uh, um, was a lawyer that I went to to help me with a contract <laughs> with a uh, another writer um, who uh, was uh, had written a novel that was uh, a, a film director was interested in it. And the film director came to me and said, if, um, if I can get this book published, uh, I'll have a bit, an easier time raising money for the, for the film. And it was, a, it was a thriller. And I said, yeah, I know somebody who, who will publish this. Um, they're just starting a new list. And I went to the, I was going to do it for free for the film director. Um, and the author said, no, no, uh, I insist on it being done the right way. So I went, I, I went and saw, saw the lawyer and he said he wouldn't send me a bill until I read his manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, that was an, a gazillion years ago. He's now 93. And he's doing another book of short stories, but he's won the Leacock Award. There were films. There's now uh, a, a stage musical that's be, being planned, whether it will come to fruition, who knows. But, um, and after that, um, writers came to me on referral. So that, that is the best way to get an agent is to get a, a, a writer um, who has been introduced by, some, by, by another writer, by somebody else. And um, it's a small, you know, it's a small community we live in here. So it doesn't take too much to, to find uh, a personal link uh, that someone says, this guy's got, got some talent. Um, go for, you know and so and i do at least look at or respond to everybody who has been referred by someone i know mm -hmm. i figure um that's that's my community and there has to be some way of triage mm -hmm. now there are people that I, I haven't been introduced to that way but mostly it, it has been word of mouth. So that's all I can, that, and, and I think it, it works for the author too, because um, the, they know that the agent then is reputable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit further into the process once more. Um, 
because I think people would be generally interested in this. So what is the process from signing an author to selling a book? Um, and I'll start with Barbara. Well, so um, Sam uh, took me on when I was at um, uh, a pretty, I'd gone several drafts into a story that I had already pitched to him um, pre previously. And um, he made some recommendations and I did a, an edit based on that. And he took it on and um, uh, yeah, and I don't really know what happens after that. <laughs> So then he takes it over and he decides how he's going to market it. And I'm sure they're going to talk about that specific part. But um, basically, he he gave me feedback that got that that made me take the book to the point where it went from being submitted to him to being submitted to publishers. And so that was that was our interaction. And then he took it over from that. Sam, do you I, I, yeah, I think every book basically has a, a slightly different process. Like, um, it's different if you're selling nonfiction versus fiction, for example, and it's different if you're selling a kid's book or a picture book or whatever. So it depends on where in the spectrum of, of books you're at. Um, fiction is the hardest, especially, well, all fiction, I mean, even commercial fiction, because it's just so... Um, uh, the marketplace is so uh, like competitive. But in the case of Barbara, what I remember thinking was, there's really nothing about this book that makes it local. So we had a very wide submission. So sometimes I'll do that. I'll say, let's try, let's try everywhere that, you know, in the, in the English markets, including, you know, the UK, Canada, and the US for selected publishers that are looking for this kind of book. And then you kind of, you know, have a crazy day where you send something out to like 30 publishers and then you just wait. Um, and other times it's very specific because you might have a book that's just aimed at um, a very specific um, audience. And then in, in that case, it might be six, six or seven editors because they're the only ones, for example, um, that like superheroes. I have a, a writer who is in Victoria Paul Zare is his name, and he wrote a book called Becoming Batman because he wanted, he's a, so he's a professor, and he wanted to explore the idea of, is it actually possible for a human being to become Batman? <laughs> so, <laughs> so like a Batman book, a book that's 300 pages about how would you do this? How does Batman do that? And by the way, the answer is you can if you start training like an Olympic athlete when you're three or four. <laughs> And you can become Batman and do all the things that he does, except for one thing, which is Batman will go out and fight and then, you know, get hurt. And then the next day he's out again. And we're, you know, we never see Batman in the reality. He'd be in the hospital in traction, you know, just <laughs> got like broken ribs and he's wounded and he's out for like weeks. But And so that's the only difference. But he did say that from his studies, um, you can only be Batman. It's kind of like being any Olympic athlete, you know, like, you can be Usain Bolt for so long and then you retire. You're like, I'm done. I've, I've made my, I've made my record, uh, set my records and I'm done. So his thinking, I think Batman would retire around 29 or 30 because he would just be too old at that point. <laughs> so again, that would be a very specific audience of editors who, you know, we'd have to, uh, I mean, I remember at one point I was calling people saying, who likes Batman? <laughs> and I would just call everybody like, who in New York, who in Toronto, who likes Batman? So where did you place it? Did you place it? <laughs> oh, um, we eventually, uh, the first book was uh, done without an agent, the Becoming Batman. That's how I heard about him. So I, I called him and I said, I love this book. I love Batman. And then he said, um, my next, uh, uh, it was with Johns Hopkins University Press. And then his next one was on Iron Man. And I said, I don't think Iron Man's as big, but then he proved me wrong. Cause then the movie came out with uh, Robert Downey Jr. So I'm like, oh my God, I missed that one. <laughs> and then anyway so we we're working on another batman project now so went to the oh, back good. <laughs> <laughs> well batman was his biggest book because i think i think batman is eternal at this point there's always going to be a version of batman somewhere whether it's you know it's no longer george clooney or um uh who was the dark knight i can't remember now oh Chris, uh, christian bale but it's going to be uh jim uh, jim pattison right the the new batman from Twilight, or oh, Robert oh, Pattinson, sorry. Robert, yeah. Robert Pattinson. <laughs> um, 
So good for um, you. <laughs> um, Beverly, um, what, is, what else might go on in that process? Um, um, just a lot of rejections. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I, I, you're re rejected um, at 15 minute intervals, day <laughs> in and day out. Um, uh, it's, um, and it can take a long, it can take a long time to, to place an author. Uh, it's, and it's usually not about the material or the, or the, the work itself. Sometimes it is, um, but it's how much a publisher needs a particular book or a genre or uh, at, a, at a time. It's, um, uh, the, it's the capacity also. I mean, with all of the um, mergers and acquisitions, there's not an awful lot of ca capacity left in certain fields um, and the publisher, the big publishers want, they want to sell 50,000 copies of a book when realistically the market that's there for a book may, may only be a, um, a, about a, a thousand, 1500, but a book can be influential way beyond its sales figures. Uh, uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it, you just have to dig in and be persistent. Um, and you might find it, it can sometimes take you a long time to place a book. Paige, how about, um, from your perspective? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it depends what kind of project it is, like Sam said, but it also depends how ready that project is. Um, regardless, you know, I'll only take on a, a project, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, poetry, if when I read it, I have like a really clear vision for it. So if it needs work, then I have to know, like it has to be very clear to me what revisions would need to be made in order for me to feel like it was in the best possible shape to go out on submission. Um, and then obviously I'd have to talk to the author and make sure that those suggestions resonated with them and, and, were on, and they were on board. Um, but I also have to have a really clear vision of who I would take it to based on the relationships that I have with editors at various publish publishing houses and knowing what they're looking for and just keeping an eye on what's happening in Canada, in the US, in film and TV, in the UK, in the foreign markets of what's selling, what's working um, and using all of that to to inform my understanding of the market and where this project might fit in. Um, and authors should know that everything that they have to do, we pretty much also have to do as agents. So, you know, we also, we have to write submission letters, which are basically query letters. Um, we have to, as Beverly says, like we submit it to a bunch of places and we face constant rejection um, and we, we have to play the long game too. So, you know, some, sometimes something we sign by an author doesn't sell. And then we just have to start thinking about what, what the next book is going to be. Um, so hopefully authors can find some solace in that. <laughs> can I say something to that too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because there's such a mirror um, from a writer's perspective as there is, you know, when you're an actor and you're auditioning for roles and not getting them, it's very easy for writers to blame their agent for a lack of success without realizing what is happening behind the scenes, how much they're submitting you, how hard they're working on your behalf. If they're taking your story on, they are committed to getting it published, but that doesn't mean it's gonna be an easy road. And so that's something that's very important to understand that you have multiple levels of rejection to face when you're a writer. There's the rejections that you face, you know, getting the agent, uh, get, and then there's the rejections that you face in the journey to getting published. And um, you have to develop a thick skin. Again, it's all about 
not giving up of keep of coming back to the project over and over again or as Paige says uh, you know what is the next project because clearly you have something interesting and dynamic uh, but there's no promise that because an agent says to you i mean i'm speaking for the agents but i i i, I i'm talking about my own experience there's no promise that when someone says your work is fabulous is a great story you know this is you know everyone's going to love this that the publishers are going to go um yeah this is the right thing we're looking at the right time because as beverly says you know the time Timing is everything. It's, it's about what the market wants. It's about how many copies they think they can sell um, for right and for wrong. So, um, you know, developing that thick skin and that resilience and that muscle tone um, to keep going back to it and not give up because it doesn't just um, go quickly or easily is very important, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that, Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> In some ways, it's even harder than that, Barbara, because even if an editor loves a book, mm -hmm. it's then their job to convince the whole company because That's a true. lot of the a lot of the publishing uh, people realized that the books that they were the most successful on were where they all agreed that it was a great book right from the beginning. And there wasn't a battle between the editors and the sales and marketing people. So they started to kind of say that it was it had to be unanimous that we all had to agree this was a great book because everybody later on down the road, you know, even if it's just the editor working on the book now in a year and a half, the, the sales and marketing people, the digital sales and marketing people, the publicity people would be working on it. So, so part of the job of, a, of an editor these days is um, it's why they have less time to edit. It's why, you know, I, I, I would say that agents are the new editors because we have to do the editing because they don't have time to do it. It's because they're so busy trying to build consensus for a book that they love. And so, so many times I've talked to an editor where it's like, oh my God, Sam, I love this, but I don't think we're going to be able to buy it. These are the hurdles I have to go through. Now, they don't always tell me the hurdles, but some of them that are my friends will say these are the first hurdles. Like, so this person is going to make the final decision. So how do I get from here to there? And then they have to have a strategy. So it's kind of like, um, I remember reading this maybe even 15 or 20 years ago now where they said that people that went to MBA programs were failing because even though they understood the technicalities of it all, you know, the administration, the, the spreadsheets, whatever, that they were, it was, they were not charismatic enough um, or persuasive enough to convince other people they were right, which is like an essential skill in business. So even if you had the technical part, you still need the soft part. You still need to convince people that, guys, this is a brilliant manuscript. Will you please take another look at it? You missed this thing. This is, this is the audience it's going to appeal to. And you kind of have to know how to convince everybody in that publishing board that you're going to have a winner. And the people that, that tend to do this really well become stars. They find books. They convince people and then they become a, a huge name and they're the ones that get headhunted from one job to another. And they almost always, after 10 or 15 years, become publishers because they've been able to work everybody and convince everybody that they're right. And then not just their company, because then if they're right, then they convince the market that they're right, because then they, they do a, a string of bestsellers one after another. Yeah, very, very good. So oh, we can't hear you. Oh, there, that's better. Yeah. Um, so we're coming in on eight o'clock now. Um, I don't think we could get in another full question. Um, so, but before we uh, go on break for a bit until eight o five and come back for the question and answer. Um, I want to thank uh, Beverly for um, participating in the event. Um, she'll, she will not be here for the second half, um, but we are very thankful nonetheless for her participation. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. So um, as I said, we'll be going on break till um, 8.05, so I will see everybody then. Yeah. Bye, Beverly. Bye. Nice to meet everybody. Yeah, nice to see you.
Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, it is 8.05, so I think we are going to start um, the next portion of this event. Um, and I hope everybody had a nice break, uh, got some water, stretched, went to the washroom. One of the advantages of being on a Zoom call. <laughs> um, so understanding that one of the most difficult aspects in writing is creating a first page to your manuscript that entices publishers and literary agents alike. Uh, we ask participants to submit the first page of their manuscripts so that our lovely speakers who have experience reading manuscripts can provide advice and insight into that process. So we appreciate all those who submitted uh, their first pages in advance of the event. And this morning, I randomly selected one, uh, which I will read in a moment. And then Sam, Barbara, and Paige uh, will be given an opportunity uh, to comment on the manuscript by providing feedback and constructive uh, advice. Uh, the manuscript read will, of course, be anonymous, um, but I thank the writer ahead of time for submitting it and allowing us to discuss the work. And so uh, now I will read the first page. Nursing the initial shock of a breakup takes at least two people. Then getting over the man takes an entire team of 10. Katie has neither. It has been exactly three days since Martin walked out the door of his own apartment. And last Katie checked, he's already settled into a new apartment of his own in San Francisco. S F T as he calls it. The breakup was not that, not a, that's it, I just can't take it anymore. It was more of a, I've been planning this for maybe six months and today just happens to be the day of my flight. It's not the premeditated act that has her stomach twisted in knots, but rather how natural it seemed. Like he was just going off on a business trip for about three weeks. He didn't want any of his belongings outside of the two suitcases he could pack. He didn't want his furniture, he didn't want her. If he had just asked again, she would have moved on for him again, but he didn't even try. Katie turns in her place, careful not to fall off the couch. That morning, she finished sleeping in her bed, and then she moved to sleep on the couch. She doesn't have to check into work until 9 a.m., and no matter how drained and tired she felt, it was impossible to keep her eyes shut for long enough overnight before she jolts awake at 4 a.m. Now the sun is peeking through the curtains she haphazardly closed on Monday, day two. A sliver of warmth lands on her face, warming her complexion to something presentable. The sun spots on her cheekbone dance in the light, knowing they'll get a new friend next to them in a matter of weeks. Katie cranes her neck to see if there might be anything on the small kitchen island, one of the many pieces of furniture Martin left behind to eat. Nothing. She returns to her fetal position on the couch, this time facing the TV, staring straight ahead. Her eyes land on the watch, which Martin also left behind and they water. Okay, so um, now we're, you know, have some time to uh, discuss the first page. Um, so um, Sam, how about we start uh, with you? I might be the, the um, easiest <laughs> of the three of us. I would look at more of this because the the, 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 there's a kind of emotional thing that worked for me, which is the idea of being blindsided by somebody is interesting to me. And um, now there, there's some parts of it that are written a little generically, but I feel like there's some genuine emotion there. And I would push this writer to say, I need something more original, like give me some more details about this or that, because, um, and if, I don't know if there's gonna be time, but I can read you, there was a book that I sold at, at, to Knopf in New York that has, probably the best breakup scene ever, just so that you could compare what this person wrote versus what I sold, you know, um, for a lot of money, the, the, the difference. But this, I'd say half of it is there for me. And it's what I would, but also I'm really into finding people and saying, I think there's something here. You need to really, if you really wanna work on this, I think we can do somewhere because you've got the hardest part of it, which is to me getting that kind of emotional hook. Um, blindsiding works it's great because you how many of us have never been blindsided by in any in any way whether even if it's like 
somebody that we're living with. Like when people, we get blindsided all the time. People are like, I'm like, what? What's happening here? So uh, the idea of this guy not giving her any notice, but then her thinking he'd been planning to leave for six months and just had to wait for the right time to kind of sneak out. And um, it's the kind of thing that people are always gossiping about, you know, like, sorry, gossiping about like, this is what happened to this person. Did you hear that this this person went away and they came back and the apartment was empty. What, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, I would say, uh, you know, I'd be interested in reading more and seeing whether it got better or worse from the, for that page. But uh, yeah, there was, uh, I might be the easiest audience because I like that kind of stuff. I want to, I want an emotional connection. I'll stop there. Yeah. And Paige, um, did your, reaction line up with Sam's or was it a little different? Yeah, I would definitely keep reading based on the first page here. Um, I thought that there were a few things in this first page too that did a good job of communicating the author's voice and the tone of the manuscript. So I just, I like jotted down some notes, um, which I can just walk through if you want, like a, I don't know, a peek behind the curtain of like what I was thinking as I read this. Um, so my first thought, and I think you read the chapter title, Emily, but is it's called After Martin, Day Three. <laughs> and so my first thought was like, why not day one? What happened on day one and day two? Just a question, not a bad thing or criticism at all. But so in a way it's good because immediately I was like, I wanna know more. Um, I liked the detail SF as he calls it. Like that's a really telling detail about who this person is without you know put, like spelling it out on the page which is always something like you'll hear a million times as a writer is show don't tell and so this is a really good example of that I thought that saying it was more of a I've been planning for maybe six months and today just happens to be the day of my flight like that is really helping me establish the tone in the, this first paragraph there's going to be a kind of comedic element to this manuscript which I like um, I, I liked the fourth paragraph, how it starts now, the sun is peeking through the curtains. She haphazardly closed on Monday, day two. Again, tying back to that chapter title. Um, I, I liked that reference and it just shows me that this author is thoughtful and that there are gonna be little things like that throughout the manuscript that tie back to one another. And also I liked the detail about sunspots on her cheekbone dance in the light because that is a good way again of showing me what season it is and not telling me explicitly so those are some of the things that that i really gravitated to in this manuscript and that i thought um demonstrated the the talent that this writer clearly has thank you and barbara um how about from your perspective Where's yes so, I mean, I, you know, I think that already the writer has clearly done what they're supposed to do, which is to get the attention of two agents. So you know, <laughs> anything I'd say after that would be gravy because um, uh, I, I also made notes of the things that really stood out for me, the, the way, and this can be applied to all for, or taken in by all writers, is the way this writer used um, specifics to describe um, uh, the world. So I feel very located in this world. I feel very present in this room. Um, and that's via very specific details that this writer has put into this, um, to this page. Um, like Sam said, I, get a, I also put down emotion. Um, so I, I connected immediately with the, the lead's emotional state. And I think that's extremely important when you're when you're trying to draw in readers to read the, to get them to read past the first page. Um, I thought the voice was strong. Um, I uh, I thought the relationship connection with uh, Martin and and the after him was strong. Um, the one thing that I would say uh, that might be a um, feedback for developing this page, and again, I don't know if the agents would agree, uh, but. Um, I always find when, you know, when you read, you know, when you go to see a Shakespeare play and it takes you a little while to orient yourself to the language, that actually is true for every writer's material, that we come into your work and we're, we're acclimatizing ourselves to your language, to your voice, to the way that you, the way that you speak on the page. And so I actually didn't really settle into this read until 
It's not the premeditated act that has your stomach twisted in knots. There was something so um, so straight and and clear and strong about that. I, I was almost tempted to say to the writer, maybe start here. Um, but there's so much interesting information in the first paragraph. So it's really more about um, uh, your roles as writers is to draw us in. And the sooner you can do it, the sooner we understand your language, uh, the more you have us. And, um, but I think the writer definitely did what they're supposed to do, which is to connect us to the emotional state and the, the storyline. What I'm curious about, what I'm curious about is what is this story going to be about? Is it about a woman um, recovering from a breakup? If so, then um, you've told us that off the top. If it's about a woman recovering from a breakup who then goes on to do something else, I would love to see some kind of hint of what that future story is going to be so I know what kind of book I'm about to read. Yeah, I hope that's clear. So that, that would be my feedback. Yeah. And maybe if um, on the note of feedback um, for Sam and Paige, if you could perhaps distill one recommendation you would have for the writer moving forward um i'll start with Paige. sure i yeah my biggest piece of constructive criticism would be the same as barbara's that it's good to know like that she's been blindsided and that pulls us in emotionally but i'm not convinced that that could sustain an entire novel or an entire novel that would go on to become a bestseller anyway unless the writing is like continues to just be so good on on every page um so i do want to know what is the story and we do on the page that i got you actually start to get i think a bit more of that which you didn't read further emily but you know i had written a note when the author says katie has neither i was like why where, where are the people in her life? And then down towards the bottom of the page, you find out, well, you, she also hints actually that she, if he had just asked again, she would have moved for him again. And so then towards the bottom of the page, you found out that she's clearly moved cities to be with this man who's now left her for another city. And so she set up shop in a place where she doesn't have any support systems and she's just been left there. And so again, is that gonna be enough to sustain like a, a best-selling or, or a commercially successful novel. I'm not sure, but at least I feel like I am getting a bit more story and there, there is a bit more of a premise. Um, I, and I just want to say, Barbara, I actually really like your edit of starting with the second paragraph. I think that pulls the reader in even, even stronger. And, and that is so often the case, just taking the yeah. first paragraph off because you know, it's the author is also, you know, immersing themselves in the world and so often when you when you cut off something from the beginning you end up starting from a much more interesting place yeah and um sam do you have anything to add um what what would really hit the sweet spot for me is if it, i kept reading and it was funny and sad because that's my favorite thing it's really hard to pull off that tone um but um it's kind of anyway it's it's just a personal thing so if they could give me that if not i could probably still work with it but um i agree with both these guys that the story is important and and a kind of consistency consistency in language i mean i i i don't want to impose this on anybody so maybe at the very end if anybody wants to stay on for five minutes i'll read the thing that i have that really got me and you'll see why and you can compare them and we can talk about that for a minute but Again, I don't want to keep everybody out, anybody up past their bedtime, but. I will also add that, you know, the first page or the first few pages, whatever the agent asks you to submit as part of your query, have to work in concert with the query letter. And that will be true even when the book is a finished product. The manuscript will probably be a lot different. The way that you would describe the book might be different. Um, but even once it's on shelves, it's going to have jacket copy, which the eventual reader is probably going to have read to inform themselves of, of what they're getting into. So I just want to make that note that, that you know, if the, the query letter would also have to be really strong and that might be the place to really tell us what the story is going to be. Although, of course, you do want to hint at that in the first few pages so that the reader is immediately pulled in. Yeah, and that's an amazing place, I think, to um, end this little activity. I hope everybody in the audience enjoyed it. 
uh, something new on our end. And I thought it was fun. And I'm going to transition over into the question and answer period. Um, and the first um, question came both in the form of a, a pre-submitted question, but also somebody also put it in the chat. I think actually multiple people put it in the chat. Um, and so there's a lot of, I think, questions about a Canadian versus a non-Canadian literary agent and whether you need to have more than one or you need to have, or you, whether it's better to submit to a non-Canadian literary agent. So uh, from your perspectives, is there a large difference between a Canadian versus a non-Canadian? Um, and are there benefits to either, to reaching out to either one? Um, I'll start with Sam. Um, it's an interesting question. I feel like it depends on the kind of relationship that people want to have. I know that, um, I know that before, I mean, it's it's weird, but there's a, I have this dim, vague memory of what life used to be like when you could just meet for coffee and have drinks and stuff. I mean, it's maybe it's a thousand years ago now, but I have this very dim memory of that. And some people like to know their agent in that kind of way, in a physical kind of way. And I feel like um, a lot of my relationships have been people that where we spend a lot of time you know, together just working on manuscripts or having drinks or doing stuff. And um, even though I'm a little older now and I'm not drinking as much, it was a lot of fun for a long time. And I think that um, it was um, uh, a certain style that some people have. And I feel like if you want that, then you tend to get somebody that is closer to you. But other people, I think, and especially now, it doesn't seem to matter as much. You could have somebody that you've only met online and have an online relationship with who's your agent. So. It's good and bad, I suppose, but um, it's always about your comfort level. I do know that when I, whenever I've gotten American clients, and in some cases, some Canadian clients who have um, become bestsellers, uh, there are a bunch of agents specifically in New York that will kind of, they're kind of like vultures. They'll go around and they'll say, this person would be a great client. <laughs> and so, you know, you do, as agents, we sometimes lose people to other agents. It just happens. So. I guess it depends on the kind of relationship that the writer wants to have with an agent. I also feel like nowadays, I think there might've been a point in the past when the Canadian agents were very specifically literary as opposed to commercial. And I feel like nowadays it doesn't matter so much that there's the commercial space has opened up and there's as many agents in Canada doing literary work as in the US. I mean, considering the size of our market versus theirs. So, so I don't know, I think that um, most of the time it's still based on what we see in the writer rather than somebody else. So there's still lots of cases where I'll say, oh, I really think I could do something with this. And then I'll say, who else have you sent this to? And the writer will say, I sent it to about 10 agents in New York and none of them got back to me. And I'll say, well, here's why. You missed something right here, but I'm not, I don't care about that. If you do these five things, I will work with you. And then they're like, oh my God, I love you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's basically, it's me, it's the agent seeing something with the writer that nobody else sees still. And it doesn't matter where you are because I mean, this writer was actually in Vancouver and it was kind of like a dark crimey kind of noir novel, but with a female character. Um, and it was like, again, it was like a sweet spot for me because I'm a huge fan of Sons of Anarchy, the TV show. So this was, and I don't know if you guys know the Lana Del Rey video called Ride, which is like a 10 minute video where she's at the back of a motorcycle and then she's naked and wrapped herself with a flag like Lana Del Rey does. But um, so this was kind of like Ride meets Sons of Anarchy. And so I said, I totally get what this book could be. And she's like, nobody else has ever said that. Like, that's kind of, <laughs> so again, it all goes back to what you as an agent, like what your um, aesthetics are, the kinds of things that you love, the kinds of things that you feel you could put into the market. And if somebody somehow, I don't even know how this writer found me because looking at my list, you would never have thought that I would like Ride Meet Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> but, but that's what I discovered this book was. And I said, that's what this book is. It should be a TV show because Sons of Anarchy and the kind of follow-up to that are all about the men. And I think nobody's ever talked about the motorcycle chicks in these gangs. 
so I was kind of convinced. So anyway, I, I signed that author based on that. And um, again, they had tried both Canadian and Americans, but it takes somebody with the right sensibility sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Barbara, how about, um, well, so certainly um, I think there is no border in terms of where you can query, and I don't think there's any restrictions as to who would take you on. I know Canadian writers who are represented by American writers. I know American writers who are represented by agents, sorry, who are represented by American agents. And I know American agents, uh, writers who are represented by Canadian agents. So it really is exactly like what Sam says. What is your connection with this person? Do you um, do they see you? Do they get you? Um, same with publishers, of course, eventually. Um, but there's no board like you know. Sam can submit me to markets in the states, to markets in around the world. So I don't need to. Ha I don't need to worry. You don't need to worry about that aspect of it if that's what you're worried about. And uh, Paige. Yeah, absolutely. To answer the question about do you need more than one agent? No, you do not. Sometimes it works out that your agent will partner with co-agents. That, that will most definitely be true for translation markets, but even, you know, maybe in the UK or the US. Um, I'd say these days Canadian agents tend to sell directly into the US. North America has just kind of become more homogenous that way. Um, and absolutely, as Sam says, it's about finding the right fit. Um, I, I would say it's probably that primarily US authors are represented by US agents and Canadian authors are represented by Canadian agents. I'd say that's still kind of the norm, but it's changing and that, you know, that's going away every day between the way that we fluidly travel, you know, when you can travel, like we're going down to New York all the time to meet with editors there. Um, the way that technology has just made it so much easier to communicate. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, it really doesn't matter. And I'd say that's even true for the UK. Like there are Canadian authors who are now represented by UK based agents and UK authors who are represented by Canadian agents. So it's really about finding the right person. And it's just so much easier to do that now in 2021. Um, so the next question comes from an audience member named Sam, um, and he's asking, uh, what does your ideal query letter look like that you'd like to receive in terms of structure, outline, and content? Um, I'm sure many people also share the same question. So um, maybe we'll start with Barbara, and I can ask sort of how you structure than what you put in your query letters. So that's maybe the most difficult journey or writing part for me of all is creating a synopsis. And, um, you know, when I needed to, to create those query letters, uh, anything where you have to take this giant work and compress it into like the top 10 lines that you could possibly do is a really daunting task. Um, but I will quote Sam because I invited Sam into one of the classes I was teaching, you know, back in the day. And you actually formulated your ideal query letter, which is what I use as my model now when I'm teaching. Oh, I'm so I glad students. to hear it. Yeah. So the one thing that my biggest takeaway from that, which is the one I will share, is that um, if you can um, synopsize, if you can give them... Um, information about yourself, who you are, what maybe makes you stand out, if you have a platform, what that platform is, um, and, um, and then synopsize your story in a crisp two paragraphs and not go into this territory where you have like a three page synopsis describing what your story is about. I mean, maybe um, Paige will disagree with that, but I, I feel like the, the tighter and sharper and stronger and more precise your language is in your synopsis, um, the more effective it's going to be, the more they're going to pay attention, the more they're going to, you know, not turn the page and go, I don't, you know, or turn, get out of that email and whatever. So that's my biggest piece of advice. Tell them who you are, what you're writing, what the book is, and, um, and, and your connection to that, to that specific person. Um, I guess the question is, Paige, do you disagree with that? <laughs> no, I agree with you, Barbara. <laughs> I think the query letter, in the, the description of the book should function like jacket copy. Like the goal is to pull the agent in and get them invested so that they need to 
request the full manuscript in order to, to find out how the story plays out. If the agent wants to know, like, let's say, sometimes I have this urge with thrillers because there, there's so many secrets and questions in the query itself. And I, I kind of just need to know like how it would conclude if it's as satisfying as it, as it would lead up to be. But if the agent wants to know that, they wanna know how it ends, they wanna know how it plays out, they can always request a, a longer synopsis from you. So with the query letter, you just really wanna draw them in. Um, and you also wanna make sure that you include a paragraph about who you are, what your writing experience is, if you have any. It's okay if you don't, you don't need to have writing experience, but if you do, make sure that you include that. Any publications, any bylines, any areas of expertise that might you know, come into play in the manuscript, even if it's fiction, but there's a character who, you know, it, has a certain type of job that, that that's also your day job, then just share that. Like, what is the, your personal connection to the manuscript and what are you drawing from? Because if it's, you know, write what you know, that's always gonna produce the strongest work. So um, you always wanna draw attention to that. And yeah, I get, if you have any platform, like any online, if you, if you have a Twitter, you don't even need to have a ton of followers, but if you're active there and you feel like that really demonstrates your personality and you share a lot of content, again, that might be related to the manuscript, you can always invite people to visit you there. And you know what, your agent is probably going to Google your name before they request your query anyway, so you can save them the time. Thanks. Um, and I guess um, Barbara already um, introduced a bit about what you um, think about an ideal query letter, but do you have anything else to add? So is this me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think Barbara kind of covered it. I feel like uh, for, I'm trying to think of what that person sent in the, um, the book that I ended up taking on, but you know, the, the query, basically the job of the query is to get you to look at the manuscript and it, so it must have done its job because when I started reading the manuscript, the, uh, the, the next thing that I look for is the voice and is it a compelling voice that, that kind of grabs me and this voice really did because it was this person talking about being in this motorcycle and what joy she had from it, but it was kind of, it was very dark because it was almost twisted. It's like she had this that sense of belonging to a place that nobody should really want to belong to. So you're kind of worried about her. And I'm like, are you, are you okay? Like, I, but anyway, so I, I kind of, and, and like with this um, breakup story, I want some kind of, I want a voice that's going to entertain me and kind of pull me in, but I also want it to feel something. And so um, the, 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 the queries that I respond to the most either refer to they have, like, we call it a comparable. If you say, like, when I said Sons of Anarchy meets the Atlanta Del Rey, those are two things that I'm comparing the book to. So if the comparables work for me, I'll say, like, wow, this really is interesting. Whereas if they don't, if people say this is kind of like this meets that, and I don't know what those things are, I'm probably not going to read that. I'm not going to be interested. I'm probably not even going to finish reading the query. I'm like, I don't even know what they're talking about here. So you, you want to get, um, when you are doing that kind of summary part, of the letter where you're talking about your work, you wanna get the biggest possible comparables you can versus very small comparables. And I remember I was, I once got in trouble at the Frankfurt Book Fair because I said, guys, I'm not even, don't even use books anymore. Nobody reads books. <laughs> use mo movies and TV shows. And they're like, what are you talking about? These are editors. I'm like, yeah, but all the editors know the movies and TV shows. They don't, they don't know books. So that's how far I kind of reached with my kind of universal comparables. Like both Sons of Anarchy and Lana Del Rey are not books, right? And yet I'm using that to pitch a book because I think people will get it, so. Mm -hmm. If I can add to that though, it is a fine balance between finding big recognizable comps, but not, not comping every like, YA fantasy to Harry Potter or the Hunger <laughs> Games or, you know, because everyone uses those. And so that's not going to help you stand out. And it also is just not really doing yourself a favor because you're setting the bar so high. So find something a bit more 
likely within your range. If we can, you know, get you to be the next Harry Potter or Hunger Games, amazing. We're all going to be, um, you know, fighting hard to, to do that. But in terms of standing out amid a hundred, hundreds and hundreds of other queries, try to find some more unique comps. And I think that kind of leads into another pre-submitted question, um, which was, and especially in the comparability, um, and the question is about originality and how a writer can ensure that their piece stands out as original and is not just read as the next Harry Potter, for example. Um, so uh, maybe I'll start again with you, Paige. Um, how can a writer ensure that they're that they stand out as original? Mm -hmm. I mean, that one's simple. You just you have to have an original story and or an original voice. Those are really the two most important things. And so you have to be able to demonstrate those in the query letter and in whatever sample materials that agent has requested, which are often very brief. So it is true that the, you know, the first few pages are crucial, but you don't want to put all of your time into revising those first five pages because if they work and the agent requests it, you know, they're going to quickly get beyond those five pages. So just you, everything has to be as strong as it can possibly be going back to what you know we were saying earlier that you have to feel like you have taken the work as far as possible on your own before you submit it to agents and that should be coming across through the manuscript through the, the first few pages but through the whole thing if, if it gets requested and through that query letter as well okay and um how about you barbara uh, yeah i would definitely say uh voice um, I think it's, you know, we're always looking for original material. And I also know a lot of writers come to me and they're worried about um, someone stealing their idea. <laughs> and then I have to give them the bad news that in fact, their idea actually exists in multiple forms and has been <laughs> investigated many times before. And, you know, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a great story that they can approach from an original direction. So um, I think the, the thing that stands out for me definitely is um, originality of, I, mean, I don't deal so much with prose in my classes, but um, uh, when I'm working with other writers, when we're doing writing groups and such, uh, originality of voice. And then um, in my mapping your story class, it's the originality of the way that you're coming at your material. So you don't necessarily have to express it in with an original voice at that stage, but uh, how are you looking at your material? How much deeper can you dig into your material than you know the writers who came before you? How can you take these tropes and stereotypes and storytelling um, forms that we have looked at over and over again and dig deeper underneath it? Like how deep can you get? That's what, that's what really um, interests me. Yeah, and um, how about you, Sam? Um, I agree with both these guys, and and because I know how serious Barbara is when she teaches writers, I know that she's very focused on craft and story. So I'm sure Paige, you are too, but I don't know, I don't know your your clientele. Um, but um, I I do think that sometimes it's as easy as finding something that's huge, and then figuring out your own spin on it. So here's an example. So Harry Potter's out there, it's huge. So this guy, Lev Grossman says, the problem with Harry Potter is, it's not how kids really are. Like if, if high school kids had magic, they would be using it to get effed up. They would be using it to do a bunch of shit that you wouldn't, that these Potter kids, you know, in, in Hogwarts don't do. So he wrote a series called The Magicians and then that became Everybody's like, this is better than Harry Potter because these kids are doing drugs <laughs> with their magic. They're not just, well, let's just, you know, we have to save the world and we're very earnest British kids. So he kind of Americanized the idea. And then you have other people that uh, do their own spins on it. Like there were two big books that were bought based on using um, uh, Game of Thrones as a comparable. And one was a writer saying, I want to do Game of Thrones set in Africa with like, you know, African lore and and fantasy that was as everybody said we love this idea but they just bought it you know i mean obviously there has to be a story and there has to be talent there but i'm just saying the pitch and then at the same time because this was the moment where you know it was all game of thrones all the time because the series was so big and everybody was screaming for the next book um 
but the other one that I thought was funny, which sold also immediately at auction was um, Game of Thrones for teenage girls, like a YA version and, and with, with girls only, because it was like some other kingdom where they were all fighting for, you know, to be queen, I guess, or, or king, who knows. But um, I just love the idea of, the, of the, how simple those pitches were. Again, like Paige says, you want to be careful that you don't compare yourself to those books. But if you say, imagine this world and this story, but then we've done this to it, you can get away with that. But again, you have to, you have to mean it. It has to be good enough to be worthy of that comp. Otherwise, you're just going to disappoint people and you're just going to, everybody's going to say, oh my God, I was so excited about this. But by the third sentence, I knew that they couldn't do it. Mm. Um, so the next question is based off of one that was submitted um, by an audience member, and it's something that I've noticed to be um, a common question amongst people at these events. Um, and it's how, um, in considering the fact that a lot of these conversations are fiction uh, heavy or fiction centered, how can somebody who writes poetry or children's books or even nonfiction approach a literary agent and does how does that change? Um, I will start with Barbara. Um, I, I, I don't really know so I think I'll, I'll defer to um, Sam and Paige but um, I will say that um, uh, I think those genres all have audiences and certainly nonfiction probably has more of an audience even than than fiction. Um, so I don't think that's a negative, but I think we need storytelling of all kinds. So um, I, I do think, you know, be persistent and use the information you've received earlier in terms of who those markets would be for those, who, which agents, which publishing houses would be open to those. We need all those kinds of stories. So I'll just continue to encourage you to write them, um, but I'll pass it over to, to Sam and Paige. Either, either or. Um, how about uh, nonfiction? Shouldn't be hard. There are lots of agents who do nonfiction, so it's really just about spending time on agencies' websites, reading the agent bios. Often, they'll list there what they're looking for, the areas that they rep, and what they're currently seeking and what they're currently closed to. Um, there are a lot of resources online as well. If they don't list it there. Um, that, that track what agents are doing when they're open, when they're closed. Um, poetry and children's books. So those are two of the genres that tend to, more authors writing in those areas tend to be unagented um, just because of the nature of the publishing houses that they are, are selling their work to. Um, and just kind of the business models that poetry publishers and children's book publishers use doesn't always support um, the involvement of an agent. But having said that, it's definitely changing for poetry. Um, it depends what kind of poetry you're writing. And if you have, I mean, poetry is so popular online now. So if you can demonstrate a following, whether it's a blog or Instagram or TikTok, then that's really going to help open doors for you. And for children's books, there are agencies who specialize entirely in children's books in representing children's book authors and children's book illustrators. So it's really just about mining the internet to, again, find that partner. And remember, you don't necessarily have to be limited to Canada. Yeah. Sam, do you have any? I, th I think Paige covered it pretty well. I, I you know, the, with, about kids' books. It is a completely different model because, you know, with adult publishing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you are selling to the trade, which is like chapters Indigo here in Canada, Amazon, you know, the independence, Amazon.ca. Um, but with kids publishing, the, the editors are looking more to sell to the libraries and the schools directly because, you know, middle graders don't buy books they just read whatever you know they're kind of a captive audience the young adults do that market 16 and up but again they, they are they're looking at things like social media if, if uh, a writer has a social media following that's kind of what happened with john green to kind of um he he took off because he got a social media following that was millions of people and then they started to buy his books but because he had a youtube chat with his brother where they would just talk <laughs> And people are like, oh my God, I like John Green, I'm gonna buy his books. So um, different business models. Um, I think that's it though. Uh, you, you definitely, like Paige says, you should do your homework. You should find somebody who is actively looking for the kind of book you have rather than submitting blindly. 
Um, so the next question um, I thought was fairly uh, interesting. Um, I think it's because oftentimes, you know, we hear about uh, publishers and people think, oh, I'm going to become a publisher, I'm going to become an editor. Um, but for the literary agents um, here, uh, why did you become a literary agent? Um, and what maybe that, can that tell us about the relationship between a literary agent um, and a writer? So I'll start with Paige. Um, I'm not sure if the audio cut out. Oh, I think my internet's freezing a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, just navigating the world. Okay, I think I'm back. Sorry, who did you want to start with, Emily? Um, I was planning on <laughs> starting uh, with you, but if... Um... Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Yes. If you lose me, you can just hop over to Sam and I'll relocate. But, um, but happy to start. So yes, when I knew I wanted to get into publishing, like I, I started university for journalism, realized very quickly that, that was not the right path for me, switched into English, figured out pretty quickly I wanted to get into publishing. Um, and then that was 2012 when I was start, starting to make my way. And so internships were still a big thing then, which for very good reasons, they're mostly not happening unless they're affiliated with schools now. But that was, you know, I entered the industry in a very traditional way. I did a few internships, including one with Sam at the Wrights Factory. And that was really my first introduction to agenting, which to be honest, I didn't know very much about um, because, sorry, as I, I, I started to say earlier, like most people get into publishing, I wanted to be an editor. Uh, that, was, that was the dream, but then I learned more about agenting and I was so taken with how involved agents are in each part of the job. Um, and so that, you know, that was the first job being offered in publishing was with Cook International. And I jumped at the, at the chance because it, and I always say like, I'm so grateful that that is where I started. And, you know, here I am now at Cook McDermott on the domestic side, but eight, eight, nine years later. Um, I'm so grateful that that's, that's where I landed because I feel like you get a great overview of the industry by working at an agency. Um, it's really the best introduction to, to publishing and how it works that there is. Thanks for that. Um, Sam, why did so you- So I had a, a, a kind of longer and lengthier and more difficult journey in that I started with literary magazines and then I had a small press for a while. So for me, the reason why um, I chose agenting in the end is because I didn't understand this when I was a publisher because I loved being a publisher. I loved the one thing that a publisher can do that an agent can never do is tell you when your book's coming out. And that's really profound for people. Like, I love this book. I'm going to, um, I'm going to bring it out on this at the, on this date, and then you then you have to make it happen. So, um, one of the things that uh, I kind of got, I guess I got waylaid by was the idea that I was having to have, like, print a bunch of books, figure out how to sell them while signing new books. And I had a small team, and I was having a lot of fun with it, but I was never making really a lot of money at it. I was doing these beautiful little books that nobody bought, and so when um, I decided I got this crazy offer through a headhunter to be a, an agent. And it took me a while to be like, I kind of felt that in my gut that it was the right thing, but I didn't realize until I started agenting how, how much in a way, how much I preferred it because it was actually the kind of agenting that I was doing was exactly what I was doing as a publisher, but I was doing all the work for the publisher by getting the author and getting the thing ready and then showing it to them and hopefully having more than one of them interested and then they would actually pay for the printing and pay the advance and put all the money down and and the, the the investment that i would make was basically in time and that's what to me the difference is is that the agent invests time in the project and obviously our own talents so we we put those things in but then we don't have hard costs whereas a, a publisher you know you if you're an employee at a publishing company, if that company 
you know, the reason why a company like Penguin Random House is, um, uh, is doing so well and, and is growing so much is because they have, they, they manage a bunch of properties internally that make them a killing. So for example, like I'll, I'll give you a kind of um, business example. So I, when, I remember when I was growing up and I had friends that went to like school, I went to uh, technical school, um, but you know, people would then do like an engineering degree and an MBA. And um, so people were like, oh, well, you know, half my friends are doing MBAs. And then some of them would get these jobs where at a company like Procter & Gamble, where they were the, the product manager for Crest toothpaste or, you know, some kind of soap like palm olive. So you have a brand that is established and sells at a certain number and then you manage it. And so what I realized was all my friends that got into publishing, the people that stayed there were brand managers. So one guy, for example, I said, what are you doing right now? And he's like, well, I'm doing you know, Kurt Vonnegut and uh, John Cheever and one, I can't remember the third one, but oh, Norman Mailer. <laughs> and I'm like, I bet you nobody's buying Mailer or Cheever. He's like, yeah, everybody's buying Vonnegut. So, so his job was to keep Vonnegut interesting. And so they would, occasionally they would redesign the packaging. They'd say, we're doing all the Vonnegut books again with these hot new designs. So they were essentially brand managers because they had a product that kept selling every year consistently the way that you know, Dove Soap or Palmolive or Crest or whatever. So they were, they were brand managers. So they were thinking like MBAs and um, occasionally they would get a chance to buy some new books, but really the bread and butter came from managing an, a kind of brand internally. You know, a, a, one of my friends at Knopf in New York said, oh, I've just been given Murakami where we're doing all the Murakami books. So it's like they're brands. That's how they see, you know, in the publishing company, that's how they see you. So the thing um, that I like about the, the different thing about that agents do is we still get to be like the early editors from the Max Perkin days, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys know Max Perkins, but there's an award named after him, but there's a great movie called Genius where Colin Firth plays Max Perkins and Jude Law plays Thomas Wolfe. Um, it's kind of like a little melodramatic, but it's not a bad movie. So well, it's, a good, it's a good look into the editing process. I always tell my students to watch it because it's a very it's a good, good look into the edi editing process. Yeah. Yeah. So especially when you're Thomas Wolfe and you write thousand page manuscripts and you have to <laughs> exactly. give it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, what's happening here? Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, that's kind of like my, my thoughts about it. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to end uh, the panel today on a more optimistic note. Um, so this uh, was a question submitted to us. How do I remain hopeful amidst rejections from literary agents? Mm -hmm. How, what is some advice that you would give to new aspiring emerging writers? Um, I'll start with Barbara. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough one, as I said before, that the the muscles you need to build to be able to withstand um, multiple rejections. I mean, I don't wish that for anybody. I don't wish that for any writer, um, but it's something that you might as well um, know going in that you need to maybe have some um, management skills around that. And I always tell my my I always tell my writing people, all of my writing people, that there are four stages of writing grief. And this is actually comes from, I don't remember the name of the author, but it comes from his dealing with his agent. There are four stages of writing grief. Um, the first one is um, uh, denial, basically, that, you know, someone will say something to you about your work and you're like, no, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you know, I wrote this. I know what I'm doing. You didn't read it right or any variation thereof. Um, the second stage is grief, uh, where you're like, I, you're right. I don't know. I'm not a writer. What was I thinking? Like, I, I don't, I, I you know, I, I can't possibly do this. Uh, the third stage is um, uh, uh, qualified acceptance, where you're basically going, okay, maybe I can write. Maybe I have some talent, but I can't solve this problem that has been brought up. And the fourth stage, and this is my advice, is get back to work. You just keep going back to the page, right? Going back to the world of writing is actually going to be your creative sustenance through your entire life. It doesn't always have to be attached to some huge success uh, agent, publication, whatever. Those are, those are cherries on top. The thing that's actually going to give you joy and 
um, uh, fuel your curiosity and your investigation of life is going to be your writing process. So you never have to be angry at your writing process um, because that's your thing. That's your thing. So keep your thing precious and um, just keep powering through. Just understand and accept that you're feeling badly. Of course, we all feel badly when we're re rejected, but one day you're going to wake up and you're going to go, okay, I'm going to go back to the page. Just keep going back to the page. Yeah, that's amazing advice. Um, Aram, do you have a piece uh, of I don't think I could top that, frankly. <laughs> but I mean, let me just think for a second. If, if people are, I, I think you have to make your best possible work before you reach an agent and then you have to find the right agent. So people are probably underestimating the amount of work required after the writing because, because you know, to be a professional, you have to do your homework. You have to. Um, you don't want to waste people's time. You don't want to waste your own time. But you do want to invest your time to figure out the, the most likely path for you. So. Great. Um, and last but not least, Paige, do you have some advice to leave us on? Yeah, I think I echo everything Barbara and Sam said already. Um, but to add to that, you know, find your writing community. Mm, that's yes. a writer's group yes. that you meet with in person online people that you swap pages with people you workshop with they're going to be your champions i hear this from writers all the time they become yes. some of their best friends and some of their most cherished colleagues and they're gonna like they're going through the same process mm -hmm. so they understand it they're going to be there to celebrate the wins with you and they're going to be there to pick you back up and give you feedback on how to improve your manuscript and your query letter when you're you're facing rejection mm -hmm. absolutely here here i think that's a great place uh to end the panel discussion uh for today um i really want to thank uh you again uh, sam Paige, barbara for speaking on the panel sharing your advice experience and insight over these two hours and to everybody in the audience, thank you for joining us, being great participants. Um, this event would not have been possible really without everybody here, um, as well as our support from Hard House and uh, the Hard House Student Literary and Library Committee. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about the Hard House Student Literary and Library Committee, uh, this was our last event for 2020, 2021 but we will be back with a new round of literary-based programming in the fall, new how to get published, new how to find a literary agent. Um, so please follow us on social media, check out our website, uh, hhlitandlib.ca. So I'll leave the call on for about another five more minutes. Uh, maybe Sam can share with everybody <laughs> his best thing. story yeah, ever. That's so cute. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's it on my end. Uh, I'm wishing everybody a really great night. Uh, stay safe um, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks for including us. Thanks so much, Emily, Thanks for so organizing much, Emily. this. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna read. So this is a book from, it's a few years old now, but what I, what I want you to listen to is how she gets into the meeting of this guy and then the breakup so that they're connected. So I'm just gonna start here. Um, uh, where is it? Yeah, okay, here we go. When she first met Doug, her friend Lainey said, Doug Winklepeck is such an unfortunate name. Claire agreed, but continued to date him. On their third date, he said, I would like to be exclusive with you if that is what you want as well. It, seemed, it sounded like a business proposal, but Claire was happy to agree. Doug was straightforward and Claire liked that. He was sort of handsome in his own way and he was polite. These were all good things, Claire told herself. On their fourth date, Doug took her to see the elephants arrive in New York for the circus. They were, were marched through the Queens Midtown Tunnel at midnight. And Doug said it was something she had to see. They drank Amstel lights in a bar until it was time. And then they rushed out to the street to watch. Claire stood there leaning against Doug, drunk from her beers and the strangeness of the night. And she watched the big sad elephants march into Manhattan. They were wrinkled and dusty and magnificent. Claire wanted to cry for them, but also wanted to run up and touch their rough skin with their hand. 
she drew in a deep breath and said, oh, see, Doug whispered into her hair. I told you it's something to see. And right then, Claire felt that Doug was the right choice, the person she'd been waiting for. And anytime she started to feel otherwise, she'd whisper to herself, remember the elephants until the feeling went away. They moved in together and almost two years to the day they started dating, he proposed. The ring he gave her was a dull silver color with a vine etched on it. All along the vine were little dots of diamonds. She hated it immediately. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't want a big showy ring, he said. She just nodded and looked down at her hand. Of course she wanted a big ring. She'd always wanted a big diamond, even if she knew she was supposed to say it didn't matter. <laughs> Doug made a good amount of money. So it wasn't like he looked at the ring and thought, sorry, it's like she looked at the ring and thought, well, he loves me and this is the most he could afford. It wasn't. <laughs> he could have bought her something spectacular, but he decided to be practical. And who wanted practical for an engagement ring? They were engaged for four months. Claire tried to remember what it was during this time that caused them to fall apart. But the truth was it wasn't really anything. There were no screaming fights, no cheating scandals, no admission of past offenses. It was just that once they were engaged, they started having conversations that led them to disagree. Maybe it had always been this way and they hadn't noticed because they weren't facing the rest of their lives together. But with the ugly vine ring on Claire's hand, these talks gained importance. You only want two kids, Claire said. Doug nodded. Two is a good number. Two is affordable. <laughs> yeah, but what if one of them dies? Then you only have one left. What is wrong with you, Doug had asked her. Why would you say something like that? When Claire wanted to go out to dinner, Doug said they shouldn't to save money. When Doug talked about moving to Long Island, Claire told him he was out of his mind. When Claire watched American Idol, Doug told her she, uh, she was contributing to the downfall of American culture. When Doug pulled his pants high, Claire told him he was a nerd. It went on like this until most nights were spent in separate rooms of the apartment watching different TV shows. Then one night Doug came home and said, do you think this is working? Because I have to say, I don't. Claire stayed in the apartment. The thought of finding a new place seemed impossible. So she stayed in the one bedroom that they had shared and that she really couldn't afford. Each month she dipped in her savings to pay the rent, telling herself the moving was expensive. And until she figured out what she wanted to do, she should stay put. After Doug moved out, Claire started taking baths at night. She would soak in the tub, filling it with water as hot as she could stand. When the water started to cool, she would let some of it empty and turn on the faucet to let new steaming water pour in. Claire emerged from these baths, pink faced and dizzy. She would wrap a towel around her head and another around her body and stare at herself in the mirror. She looked like a newborn hamster before it got its fur, a doughy pink blob of skin, unrecognizable and delicate. Claire hoped for some sort of revelation during these baths. She thought soaking in soapy water would clear her head, but it didn't. Mostly she just tried to figure out where she'd gone wrong. Sometimes she wondered what would happen if Doug was still there. And almost always she replayed the actual breakup in her head when Doug said, he was leaving and Claire said, what am I supposed to do now? She hadn't meant to say it. Didn't even realize she was saying it until she heard it. And immediately she was ashamed. She didn't want to be that person that was lost without a man. Didn't want to hear her pathetic teary voice in her head admitting that she was lost saying, what am I supposed to do now? And so she soaked in the water and hoped that somehow the words would steam out of her. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. See how clear and strong and concise and readable. Like like the hamster detail, like yeah, just these images, yeah. you know, the like so the like that, what, what the person gave us was a little uneven compared to that. That was very mm -hmm, mm -hmm. polished. Yeah. 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 But also she included the what went wrong. Like she included the engagement, but she summarized it in like one page. It's like the yeah. shortest engagement ever, even though it's two years, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.